Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be continuing our lecture series on World War uh, I. More specifically, we're going to talk about the uh, battles of Verdun, uh, the Somme, and Ypres. <clears throat> so uh, Verdun is a uh, old series of fortresses in France. It's uh, very uh, psychologically important to the French. Uh, Verdun has been like long considered to be this impenetrable uh, fortress, series of fortresses. Uh, and so the French really like are, if Verdun can be taken, the French will be uh, like psychologically broken. Uh, the Germans really believe if they can, uh, you know, if, if they can just overwhelm the French forces at Verdun, they can break through the French lines and, and completely defeat the, the French. And so uh, the Germans are gonna amass just tons of war materials at Verdun. The French are, because they think these forts are impenetrable, uh, they're not gonna adequately have uh, the proper defenses in place to stop this. Uh, you know, I mean, how much does a fort matter when you have explosives anymore? I mean, it just, it doesn't. And so uh, the French, again, just not grasping how warfare has changed, uh, which uh, will lead to the longest battle of the war. The French, because, you know, nature is going to essentially step in on their side. Uh, they're going to catch a, a break and be able to reinforce Verdun. Uh, and we're going to end up having the longest battle of the war. Verdun, the, this one battle is going to last about 10 months. So uh, it's uh, this what is ultimately an unsuccessful German campaign trying to end the war on the Western Front. <clears throat> Verdun is a series of 19 different forts in France that are thought to be uh, impenetrable. It is symbolically significant uh, to, the, uh, to the French. Now, initially, Germany is going to have some initial success. They're going to take a few of the outside forts and, uh, you know, along this uh, three-mile-long front. <coughs> And so, uh, you know, the, that, that initial, initial success is uh, going to be in large part because the Germans are outgunning the, the French. And so the, uh, you know, what, what happens is that the, uh, you know, the Germans are going to have a four to one advantage when it comes to artillery and supplies. And so uh, they're going to have some initial success at places like the Mont and uh, you know, take, be able to take Fort de Mont. Uh, but uh, because we see a uh, winter storm comes in and slows down the German advance, the French are gonna be able to get in reinforcements into Verdun to slow the Germans down. And then the strategy for the Germans change, uh, changes. It starts, to, the, the Germans realize that the French aren't gonna give this up at any cost. And so uh, if they believe it, they can just kill enough Frenchmen to eventually wear the French down. And that almost happens. Uh, doesn't happen uh, because the, the British are going to help out with uh, a distraction at the Battle of the Somme uh, that kind of distracts Germany away from Verdun. Uh, but it almost works. I mean, you know, when you're talking about the, the Battle of Verdun, there's about one death per minute over that 10 month time period. I mean, that that's crazy amount of, of death. Three fourths of all French troops that fought in World War One will serve some time fighting at Verdun. So the French are throwing all their resources at Verdun to try and keep uh, Verdun in play. So uh, it's the German Fifth Army uh, that's going to be in charge of the attack there. Uh, they have railroads built up to Verdun. The French should have seen this coming. The, they have railroads built up to Verdun. Uh, the Germans uh, amass just a gigantic supply of artillery there that they have a four to one advantage. But then uh, a blizzard strikes. And when that blizzard strikes, that's going to buy enough time. You can't, you know, the technology is not there yet to be able to fight through a, a blizzard. And so it slows down the Germans, slow down their attack. That allows the French uh, to time to prepare and reinforce the area. And so the French just pour resources in through the spring, uh, resources that they desperately need. 
uh, there will end up being uh, 542,000 French casualties. Half of those are dead and not just injured, and about 434 German casualties. Uh, ultimately, the French are going to hold on. They're going to hold on because uh, the Germans are going to have to uh, take resources out of Verdun to send them to uh, the Battle of the Somme where the British are attacking. And so that gives the French the reprieve that they need. But in reality, uh, Verdun essentially takes the French out of the battle. They're not going to be able to mount any major offenses after Verdun. Uh, they're they're going to fight a defensive war still, uh, but you know it's uh, the the French are just too weak uh, to be able to uh, do much damage, which is really going to necess necessitate American involvement in the war. Um, the Germans do gain about five miles, but they uh, so they did gain some territory, uh, but they didn't accomplish their objectives. They didn't punch through at Verdun, and they didn't completely wear the French out. They're still in the fight, even though they're severely weakened and, and aren't going to be able to, to uh, mount major offensives anymore. And that leads us to uh, the Battle of the Somme. Uh, the Battle of the Somme it happens in 1916. Uh, this is a British offensive. Uh, it's designed very specifically to relieve pressure from the French. And so, uh, you know, it, this is going to be again on the Western Front, but on in more in the North. And so, uh, the British are going to just build up. Um, a, it's essentially a massive amount of resources and essentially attack the German trenches. Now, uh, the idea is they're going to soften up the trenches by dropping all kinds of artillery explosives on the, the German line. And so the idea is to do two things by dropping all those explosives onto the German trenches. One, they're hoping the explosives will blow up the barbed wire. So when they send their troops over the top, that means getting out of your trench and running across no man's land, the barbed wire will be destroyed. It won't be uh, because the uh, uh, what the, the British are going to do is they're going to use the wrong type of artillery. And so it's essentially useless. The barbed wire is going to stay intact. And the French, uh, British, I'm sorry, the British don't realize that the soldiers in the German trenches have these deep protected bunkers, right? Remember, the British don't believe in uh, building nice, soft, cushy uh, trenches because they think their soldiers will get too comfortable and they won't fight. Germans, on the other hand, build these super deep trenches and all this artillery that they drop, you know, and they drop a lot of it, uh, it doesn't really kill very many Germans. The Germans are going to be uh, saved. And so the British think that they've already killed a whole bunch of Germans and that they've destroyed the barbed wire. Uh, then when they go over the top at the Somme, disaster strikes. The Germans come out of their trenches. Uh, the strategy at the Somme is to march shoulder and so shoulder shoulder to shoulder uh, across no man's land and to march, not to run, not to crawl, but to march. And they essentially just march into a massacre. Uh, they march into just massive uh, German machine gun fire. The Germans even have the high ground here, which means that their aim is going to be uh, much better. So even though, uh, you know, we see uh, an artillery bombardment consisting of a million and a half rounds of artillery, it's essentially uh, ineffective. So uh, this bombing campaign before they go over the top lasts about a week. Uh, it doesn't really uh, do much to uh, stop the, uh, you know, to, to hurt the, the Germans or to, to stop the German defensive. Uh, when the British finally go over the top, they're forced to march. Uh, they are uh, marching shoulder to shoulder. They're going at a slow pace and the Germans just essentially mow them down. The barbed wire is not destroyed, so they get stuck in the barbed wire. Most of the soldiers are carrying, the average soldier is carrying about 70 pounds of weight on them, which is just thrown down. I mean, they're carrying like food and shovels and all this stuff expecting to uh, take over these German trenches and be able to live in the trenches. Uh, that stuff just slows them down and essentially allows the Germans uh, to massacre the, uh, the British. And so uh, what ends up happening is in one day, 57,000 uh, British are going to die. Uh, this is uh, the Battle of the Somme in British history, like this is a defining moment for them. This is their uh, greatest defeat. Uh, and it's avoidable. 
right? Uh, if they would have used the right artillery, if they would have recognized that the Germans were dug in, if they wouldn't have marched across no man's land, if they would have crawled until they were spotted. And then uh, when they were spotted, jumped up and zigzagged, not had all the weight on them so they could move fast and, uh, you know, uh, done things like that. No, a lot of these lives uh, essentially could have been uh, saved. So uh, Great Britain will actually win about seven miles of territory here. Uh, you know, and so on paper, that looks like a victory, but the British recognize it's a defeat, that it's just losing 57,000 men for, you know, seven miles of territory just isn't work it, worth it. And it's uh, just, it's absolutely uh, just demoralizing to uh, the British, average British soldier. Now, on the plus side, the Germans, or I'm sorry, not the Germans, on the plus side, the British recognize that their strategy isn't working. And after the Battle of the Somme, they're gonna change tactics. They're gonna try and go across no man's land at night. They're gonna have people like trying to sneak up and cut the barbed wire. They're gonna use the right artillery. They're gonna zigzag and run. And so uh, the British will learn their lesson. The problem is it's 1916. They've been fighting this war for two years and it took them two years to learn these lessons. And, you know, uh, and even when they learn them, they're gonna be slow to adapt. Uh, so. Uh, Battle of Somme not looking good. Both sides at this point are really wearing down. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, this is a bad thing. All of the fighting has still been on, uh, you know, either French or Belgium soil. And so no, there's been no fighting in Germany, uh, but Germany is struggling to keep up with the amount of losses that they're having too. And so both sides are just, are, they're on the ropes. And so, you know, at this point, the British and the French are just begging America to get involved. So uh, the next battle we're going to talk about, it's actually a series of battles. I put it at the end because there's three of them uh, that are going to range from 1914 to 1917. Uh, and that's going to be uh, the Battle of Ypres. Uh, I've said this before in Belgium, it's it's Ypres. Uh, in France, it's Ypres. Uh, America, it's, uh, call it Ypres, uh, which whatever. Uh, call it what you want. I don't care. Uh, I'm going to say Ypres. Uh, because my understanding is that's how they say it in Belgium, and it's in Belgium, so there you go. Um, so uh, the Battle of Ypres actually a series of three major battles. Uh, the first battle is uh, a part of the race to the sea. We talked about that after the Battle of the Marne, where everybody's trying to build trenches to kind of outflank each other, and they're going all the way, uh, you know, they're all going all the way to the North Sea there. I'm right there. So, uh, you know, trying to outflank each other. So first battle of Ypres, uh, is essentially the, the BEF, the British expeditionary force train tall to stop the Germans from outflanking them. Uh, they'll actually be able to, uh, successfully do that. So, uh, really that's kind of a draw because the British were trying to outflank them too. And so the Germans stopped the British from outflanking them and the British stopped the Germans as well. So, Call it a win for the British, call it a draw, whatever you want. The second Battle of Ypres is uh, notable for, it's the first use of uh, poison gas by the Germans, that chlorine gas. And so, uh, you know, even though, so that's 1915 a year later. So Ypres is, I mean, Ypres is important strategically because if you take Ypres, you can swing around behind your enemy. And so that's why you're seeing a series of, of battles here. Uh, the Germans believe that using poison gas will clear the trenches and then, you know, kill all the people in the trenches. And then they'll just be able to sweep in and then sweep around their enemy. It doesn't work like that, right? You use the poison gas even at, at Ypres. The, it actually kind of blows back on the Germans. So they're not able, they've got to run away too. Uh, essentially, poison gas won't clear a trench that way because it will clear a trench and the people will leave, they'll flee. Uh, but you can't occupy that space because there's poison gas there. You have to wait for the poison gas to dissipate or disappear. Uh, and by the time that does, the enemy fills the, the trench again before you can, because they're closer to it than you are. And so, uh, you know, it, it essentially it, it not going to be effective. The third battle of uh, of Ypres is some of the worst fighting in the war. This is going to be uh, essentially a, a British uh Fight. They're going to be the ones bringing the fight to the Germans, uh, and uh, they're going to come up with what they think is actually a really uh, solid plan. 
the BEF or the British Expeditionary Force uses their engineers to essentially to dig tunnels underneath no man's land and underneath the German forces and then fill those tunnels with uh, explosives, which is, uh, you know, something that the North tried in the American Civil War to no avail. Um, the, the British are going to try that method uh, to be able to blow up, to put explosives underneath the Germans and blow it up that way and create a hole. Well, they're going to do it and they're going to fill that hole with a lot of dynamite, so much dynamite that they're in Belgium. Uh, when the dynamite explodes, there's reports of shockwaves from the explosion uh, all the way in London, England, right? That's across the English Channel. It's across the sea. I mean, that's, that's a big explosion. Now, uh, once that happens, essentially the, uh, the Allied troops are going to try and cross no man's land. The problem with that is that massive explosion underneath the ground loosened up the ground. And, you know, it's again, we're, we're fighting in Northern Europe where there's all kinds of rain. And so it creates this gigantic mud. One in four of the people that die in this battle, the third battle of Ypres, are going to die from drowning in the mud. Oh, I mean, that's got to be a terrible way. I mean, dying is bad in general. Dying in war is really bad, but drowning in mud has to just be, oh, it's got to be awful. Uh, and so uh, with the the third battle uh, of Ypres, uh, we are going to see uh, 250,000 people killed, a quarter of them drowned in the mud. Uh, Great Britain is going to come out the victor here. Uh, they're going to be able to pick up territory, but they're not going to totally be able to outflank the Germans here. The, the Germans are going to be able to retreat back a little bit. Uh, and it, it, it's viewed by uh, most people as kind of the senseless victory that a quarter of a million people die uh, at, at this battle and, and not, and it's not definitive. It doesn't end the war. And so, uh, you know, it's, at this point, the British are starting to question their own commanders. Uh, they're starting to, to talk about, you know, there's, there's rumblings of mutiny. Uh, and so, you know, we're you know, after the Psalm and then, then the third battle of Ypres, uh, things are, are getting really kind of rough. And so, again, uh, we're seeing the, the necessity of, you know, by 1917 uh, of America taking the brunt of the fighting because uh, the British and the French are just essentially worn out. So uh, what are the conclusions of the early years of the war? Well, uh, the German uh, offensive saw some success, but not much. They were stopped from total victory, which means we've been pretty much talking about the Western Front. Uh, but keep in mind, they didn't win in six weeks, right? We're talking years now. So half their army's fighting in the West and the other half is fighting in the East. Uh, we'll talk about the Eastern Front a little bit later. So, uh, you know, Germany's being stretched very, very thin. The Allies have continually failed to embrace new technology uh, and to embrace new strategy. Uh, and so even though they have superior numbers, uh, they're losing at this point. Both sides are settled in to trench warfare and to defensive positions. Uh, the French have essentially lost the ability to fight offensively after Verdun. Uh, the technology of weapons are ahead of the tactics, which means massive, massive loss of life. Uh, and we are now officially in a war of attrition, uh, which is not good for Germany. Uh, that is good for the Allies because uh, the you know British are on an island. They've got colonies uh, and they trade with America, so they have goods that are coming in. Uh, the Germans are going to try and stop that with uh, submarine warfare, U-boats, uh, actually. But uh, you know, a war of attrition favors uh, Great Britain. You know, Germany's outnumber and surrounded, so it's, it's there. They have to be self-sufficient. So there's only so much time that they can fight, and essentially that's how they're going to lose. Uh, they can continue to fight in other people's territory, and they can continue to kind of you know win battles. Uh, but you know, they only have so much food, and and so there, there's a clock ticking on German success. Uh, so uh, the war at this point. By in most people's standards is a senseless meat grinder. People are just, you know, walking across no man's land into machine gun fire just is abhorrent to most, uh, you know, people's sensibilities. So that concludes our lecture for today. Thank you very much for your time. And we will pick up here kind of talking uh, about 
uh, you know, America and what's going on um, with America domestically, politically, uh, and then militarily in our uh, next few lectures. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day, and I will see you again shortly.